USS Lexington, or CV-2 as she was designated, was commissioned on December 14, 1927, and was the second aircraft carrier built by the United States Navy. Nicknamed Lady Lex, she was the lead ship of her class and was the fourth ship of the U.S. Navy to be named after the first battle of the Revolutionary War. She served with distinction until being sunk by the Japanese during the Battle of the Coral Sea in May 1942. Now let's dive into the incredible history of USS Lexington by exploring her construction, operational service, and fate. Lexington and her sister, Saratoga, were authorized by Congress in 1916 and were initially designed as battlecruisers. This was in part a reaction to the Japanese building their Congo class of battlecruisers, but was also due to a series of studies that had been conducted at the Naval War College, which had opened the eyes of the Navy to their potential use. Funding for what would become the Lexington class had been requested by the Navy as far back as 1909, but denied due to political reasons. The Naval War College viewed this design favorably for use in scouting and as fast wings in a fleet action, but not as ships that could fight in a battle line with fully armored battleships. Construction of both Lexington and Saratoga was delayed considerably due to the onset of American entry into World War I in 1917 and the pressing need for anti-submarine and merchant ships to combat Germany's undersea threat. The construction postponement meant that the Lexington class could be redesigned and incorporate the lessons of improved hitting power and armor protection, which were tragically learned by the Royal Navy at the Battle of Jutland in 1916. The design of the British battlecruiser HMS Hood was also a factor in redesigning the Lexington class, as American naval staff in England were extremely impressed by her capabilities. Originally, the Lexington class was to mount 10 14-inch 50 caliber guns and 18 5-inch 51 caliber guns on a hull that would displace 34,300 tons and be capable of producing 35 knots. By the time the design would finally be set in stone, it would be changed to 8 16-inch 50 caliber guns and 16 6-inch 53 caliber guns on a hull that would displace 43,500 tons and be capable of producing 33.25 knots. The design of the Lexington-class battlecruisers challenged the Navy's Bureau of Construction and Repair, taxing the knowledge of its naval architects and the technology of the time. The desired speed of 35 knots had only been attained previously in destroyers and smaller craft. The Lexington class required a hull and a power plant of unprecedented size that had not been seen before on a U.S. naval vessel. Careful planning was needed on the part of its designers to ensure it would have enough longitudinal strength to withstand bending forces while underway and the added stresses on its structure associated with combat. It took years between the initial and final designs for engine and boiler technology to provide a plant of sufficient power that was also compact enough to allow a practical degree of armor protection. Lexington's keel was laid down on January 8, 1921, by the Four River Shipbuilding Company of Quincy, Massachusetts. Her construction was suspended in February 1922, when she was just 24.2% complete due to the limitations imposed by the Washington Naval Treaty, which was signed on February 6, 1922. One of the limitations included in the treaty was that any capital ships that were under construction by the five signatories, the United States, Great Britain, France, Italy, and Japan, had to be canceled and scrapped. However, the treaty did allow for the participating nations to take two of the capital ships they had under construction and convert them into aircraft carriers. So the U.S. Navy decided at this point that Lexington and Saratoga would be converted into aircraft carriers. The problem was that the tonnage cap for new carrier construction, which had been set at 27,000 tons per carrier by the Washington Naval Treaty, was too low for any practical conversion of the battlecruisers. An exception, spearheaded by Assistant Secretary of the Navy Theodore Roosevelt Jr., was added to the treaty. This gave the five nations the option to convert no more than two capital ships that were under construction to 33,000-ton aircraft carriers. But even the increase of 6,000 tons, from 27,000 to 33,000 tons, was almost not enough for a conversion. It took creative interpretation of a clause in the treaty to allow for the conversion without removing half of the power plant. The clause, found in Chapter 11, Part 3, Section 1D, read, no retained capital ships or aircraft carriers shall be reconstructed except for the purpose of providing means of defense against air and submarine attack, and subject to the following rules. 
The contracting powers may, for that purpose, equip existing tonnage with bulge or blister or anti-air attack deck protection. Providing the increase of displacement thus affected does not exceed 3,000 tons displacement for each ship. Without this clause in the treaty, the two carriers would have been in serious trouble as 1928 estimates for the two ships put Lexington at an actual tonnage of 35,689 tons and Saratoga at 35,544, though on official lists the number given was 33,000 tons, with a footnote that stated, this number does not include weight allowance under Chapter 11, Part 3, Section 1, Article D of Washington Treaty for Providing Means Against Air and Submarine Attack. This would be the official tonnage listed for the Lexington-class carriers for their entire careers. Conversion of the Lexington to an aircraft carrier had positive and negative aspects when compared to a purpose-built carrier. While the conversion would have better anti-torpedo protection, larger magazines for aircraft bombs and more room for aircraft landings, she would also be a half-knot slower with less hangar space, less emergency fuel, and a somewhat narrower flight deck than if she was a purpose-built flat top. When comparing costs, the cost of a brand new purpose-built aircraft carrier during this period was $27.1 million, while a conversion of one of the Lexington-class battlecruisers, not counting the $6.7 million already spent on them, was $22.4 million. Lexington was reauthorized as an aircraft carrier on July 1, 1922. Her displacement was reduced mainly by the elimination of her main battery. Her main armor belt was retained but was reduced in height to save weight. The general line of her hull remained unaltered, as did the torpedo protection system, because both had already been built and it was too expensive to alter either component. When completed, Lexington would have an overall length of 888 feet, a beam of 106 feet, and would displace 36,000 tons. When fully loaded, she would displace 43,000 tons. Her flight deck at the time of her commissioning measured just over 866 feet in length and was 106 feet wide. Lexington was designed to carry 78 aircraft, but these numbers increased once the Navy adopted the practice of tying up spare aircraft in the unused spaces at the top of the hangar deck. By 1936, her air group consisted of 36 fighter planes, 20 dive bombers, 18 torpedo bombers, and 5 observation aircraft along with 30 spare aircraft tied up in the hangar deck. Lexington used turboelectric propulsion and was powered by 16 Yarrow boilers which produced steam that powered four General Electric turbo generators which, in turn, sent 180,000 standard horsepower to eight electric motors that turned her four screws. This setup afforded Lexington a designed maximum speed of 33.25 knots and a maximum range of 10,000 nautical miles at 10 knots. However, during her sea trials in 1928, she would reach a maximum speed of 34.5 knots. Lexington was protected by an armor belt that was tapered 7 to 5 inches in thickness from top to bottom and angled 11 degrees outwards at the top, covering the middle 530 feet of the ship. The third deck over the ship's machinery and magazine spaces was armored with two layers of special treatment steel, totaling 2 inches in thickness. The steering gear, however, was protected by two layers of special treatment steel that totaled three inches. Her gun turrets were protected with only three quarters of an inch of armor. The conning tower was protected by two to 2.25 inches of special treatment steel, and it had a communications tube with two inch sides running from the conning tower down to the lower conning position on the third deck. The torpedo defense system of the Lexington consisted of three to six medium steel protective bulkheads that ranged from 0.375 to 0.75 inches in thickness. The spaces between them could be used as fuel tanks or left empty to absorb the detonation of a torpedo's warhead. Initially, the Navy was not convinced that a carrier's aircraft could effectively substitute for the armament of a warship, especially at night or in bad weather that would prevent flight operations. So initially, the carrier's design included a substantial gun battery of eight, eight-inch, 55-caliber Mark IX guns in four twin-gun turrets. These turrets were mounted above the flight deck on the starboard side, one super-firing pair before the superstructure, and another behind the funnel. The guns could fire to both sides, but if they were fired to the port side, across the flight deck, the blast would more than likely damage the flight deck. The ship's heavy anti-aircraft armament consisted of 12 5-inch 25-caliber Mark X guns, which were mounted on single mounts, 
three fitted on catwalks on each side of the bow and stern. Lexington initially did not have any light anti-aircraft guns installed, but two sextable 30 caliber machine gun mounts were installed in 1929. They were replaced by two 50 caliber machine guns in 1931, one each on the roof of the upper 8-inch turrets. During a major overhaul and refit in 1936, her light anti-aircraft battery would be substantially upgraded. When commissioned, Lexington did not have radar systems installed on her due to the technology not being available at that time, but would receive an RCA-made CXAM-1 set in June 1941 during a refit. She did have rangefinders and fire control equipment for her 8-inch and 5-inch batteries. Lexington was manned by 2,122 officers, enlisted personnel and air crews when she was commissioned. By 1942, this number would grow to 2,791. 100 officers, 1,840 enlisted personnel, and an aviation group totaling 141 officers and 710 enlisted men. Lexington was launched on October 3, 1925, and was commissioned into the fleet on December 14, 1927. After her fitting out period and shakedown cruise, Lexington was transferred to the west coast of the United States, arriving at San Pedro, California, just north of Los Angeles, on April 7, 1928. In June, Lexington made a high-speed run from San Pedro to Honolulu in the record time of 72 hours and 34 minutes. Lexington was based in San Pedro until the spring of 1940, when the Pacific Fleet was ordered by President Roosevelt to move to the forward operating base at Pearl Harbor due to rising tensions in the Pacific. Lexington stayed mainly in the Pacific during her career, although she did participate in several fleet problems in the Atlantic Ocean and the Caribbean. These were yearly exercises that tested the Navy's evolving doctrine and tactics against potential future enemies in mock battles. During Fleet Problem No. 9 in January 1929, Lexington and the scouting force failed to defend the Panama Canal against an aerial attack launched by her sister ship Saratoga. Lexington would aid the city of Tacoma, Washington in late 1929 and into 1930, by providing 4,520,960 kilowatt hours of power from her generators when the hydroelectric dam that produced power for the city couldn't produce power due to low water levels from a drought. Captain Ernest J. King, who later would serve as the Chief of Naval Operations during World War II, assumed command of Lexington on June 20, 1930, and she participated in fleet problems 12 through 15 between 1931 and 1934. During a joint Army-Navy exercise in 1933, Lexington, along with her sister Saratoga, successfully conducted a mock air attack on Pearl Harbor at dawn on January 31st without being detected. During Fleet Problem 16, from April to June 1935, Lexington ran low on fuel after five days of high-speed steaming, and this led to experiments with underway replenishment that later proved essential to combat operations during the Pacific War. During Fleet Problem 17 in 1936, she would routinely refuel her escorting destroyers. Lexington would head to the Puget Sound Naval Yard in 1935 for a refit. Platforms mounting 450 caliber machine guns were installed, and an additional platform was installed that wrapped around the funnel. Six 50 caliber machine guns were mounted on each side of this last platform. In 1936, she would get a more extensive overhaul, where her forward flight deck would be widened. In 1937, Lexington would participate in the annual fleet problem. Then she would be dispatched to help search for the famed aviator Amelia Earhart after she was lost in the Central Pacific. She would then participate in the annual fleet problems from 1938 to 1940, with the 1941 exercise being cancelled due to rising tensions with the Japanese. In October 1940, she would have four 3-inch 50 caliber Mark 10 guns installed in the corner platforms. They would replace two of the 50 caliber machine guns which were remounted on the tops of the 8-inch gun turrets. Another 3-inch gun was added on the roof of the deckhouse between the funnel and the island. Some of these weapons were just for interim use until the quadruple 1.1-inch, 75 caliber Chicago piano gun mounts could be installed in August 1941. On December 5, 1941, Lexington, along with her escorts, got underway for Midway Island to deliver 18 marine dive bombers. On the morning of December 7th, the task force was about 500 nautical miles southeast of Midway, 
when it received news of the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. The task force received orders that afternoon that canceled the ferry mission and ordered it to search for the Japanese fleet while rendezvousing with Vice Admiral Wilson Brown's task force. Captain Frederick Sherman needed to maintain a continuous combat air patrol and recover his fuel-starved fighters. With the Marine aircraft aboard, Lexington's flight deck was very congested. So Sherman decided to steam full speed astern, basically in reverse, in order to launch a new combat air patrol off of the stern and then swap back to resume forward motion to recover his current patrol. This unorthodox action allowed him to maintain a continuous combat air patrol and recover his aircraft without the lengthy delay caused by respotting the aircraft on the flight deck from the bow to the stern and back to make space available for launch and recovery operations. Lexington launched several scout planes to search for the Japanese fleet that day and remained at sea between Johnston Island and Hawaii, reacting to several false alerts until she returned to Pearl Harbor on December 13th for fuel and provisions. Designated as Task Force 11 and reinforced by four destroyers, Lexington and her cohorts steamed from Pearl Harbor the next day to raid the Japanese bases in the Marshall Islands in an effort to distract the Japanese from the Wake Island Relief Force led by her sister, Saratoga. The attack on the Marshall would be canceled on December 20th, and Task Force 11 was ordered northwest to cover the relief force. The Japanese captured Wake before they could get there, and the acting commander of the Pacific Fleet, Vice Admiral William S. Pai, reluctant to risk any carriers against a Japanese force of unknown strength, ordered both task forces to return to Pearl, and they did so on December 27th. On January 10, 1942, while patrolling in the vicinity of Johnston Atoll, two of Lexington's Douglas TBD Devastator torpedo bombers attacked and damaged a Japanese submarine, most likely the I-19, before it could submerge. The I-19 would later sink the carrier Wasp, destroyer O'Brien, and heavily damage the battleship North Carolina in September 1942. After this, Lexington would spend the rest of January into mid-February patrolling the waters of the South Pacific in an effort to keep the sea lanes between Australia and the United States open. On February 20th, Lexington's radar acquired 17 Japanese Betty bombers at 4.25 in the afternoon, and the newly launched combat air patrol barely had time to reach the altitude of the Japanese before they arrived. Lexington had 15 fully-fueled Wildcats and Dauntlesses on her forward flight deck that had been moved forward to allow the patrolling fighters to land. They represented a serious fire hazard, but they could not be launched until all aircraft on the flight deck were moved aft. Cognizant of the danger, the deck crews succeeded in respotting the aircraft, and they were able to take off before the Japanese attacked. Only four of the nine Bettys in the first wave survived to reach Lexington, and all of their bombs missed. They were all shot down on their way out, including one by a Dauntless. The losses were not all one-sided, as the Bettys managed to shoot down two of the defending F-4Fs. The second wave of eight bombers was spotted at 4.56, while all but two of the Wildcats were dealing with the first wave. Lieutenant Edward O'Hare and his wingman were able to intercept the bombers a few miles short of Lexington. O'Hare shot down five of the attacking Bettys, becoming the Navy's first ace of the war, and an ace in a day. He would also be awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor for his actions on this day. None of the bombers during either wave struck the wildly maneuvering Lexington. Only three of the Bettys reached their base, as Wildcats and Dauntlesses pursued and shot down several others as they attempted to flee the action. More patrolling followed this action until March 10th, when Lexington, along with the USS Yorktown, attacked Japanese shipping as it sat off the coast of New Guinea, near the villages of Leh and Salamaua. The Japanese were somewhat surprised as the strike planes flew over the Owen Stanley Mountains to the south. The U.S. carrier pilots used the surprise to their advantage, sinking three transport ships and damaging several others. After the attack, Lexington's task force made for Pearl Harbor, arriving there on March 26. Upon her return to Pearl, Lexington received a quick refit that involved the removal of all of her 8-inch guns and the addition of seven quadruple. 1.1-inch 75-caliber Chicago piano mounts. In addition, 22, 20-millimeter 20 Ehrlichon anti-aircraft cannons were also installed throughout Lexington. These additions brought her armament to 12 single-mount 5-inch guns, 12 quadruple 1.1-inch mounts, 22 Ehrlichon guns, and at least two dozen 50-caliber machine guns. Lexington would leave Pearl Harbor in mid-April after her refit to deliver Marine fighters and conduct training. In early May, after Allied codebreakers figured out Japan's next move, 
Lexington would head into the Coral Sea looking to thwart the Japanese plans to invade Port Moresby. On May 7th, Lexington would begin her participation in the Battle of the Coral Sea. On the morning of the 7th, Lexington and Yorktown launched a strike, and dive bombers from Lexington would hit the Japanese carrier Shoho twice with 1,000-pound bombs, while her torpedo bombers would land five hits on the carrier, leaving her dead in the water to be finished off later by planes from Yorktown. The Japanese would launch a strike later that day, but would abort it after not being able to find the two American flattops. The next day, May 8th, both fleets spotted each other at about the same time, and strikes were launched. Planes from Yorktown and Lexington were successful in hitting one Japanese carrier, the Shokaku, but failed to permanently put her out of action. The inbound Japanese strike reached Lexington at 11.05 a.m., and she quickly took two torpedo hits on her port side. The shock from the first torpedo hit at the bow, jammed both elevators in the up position, and started small leaks in the port aviation gas storage tanks. The second torpedo hit her opposite the bridge, ruptured the primary port water main, and started flooding in three port fire rooms. The boilers there had to be shut down, which reduced her speed to a maximum of 24.5 knots, and the flooding gave her a 6 to 7 degree list to port. Shortly afterward, Lexington was attacked by dive bombers. One was shot down by fighters before it could drop its bomb, and another was shot down by the carrier. She was then hit by two bombs, the first of which detonated in the port forward 5-inch ready ammunition locker, killing the entire crew of one 5-inch gun and starting several fires. The second bomb struck the funnel, doing little significant damage, although fragments killed many of the crews of the 50 caliber machine guns positioned near there. The hit also jammed the ship's siren in the on position. The remaining bombs detonated close alongside, and some of their fragments pierced the hull, flooding two compartments. Fuel was pumped from the port storage tanks to the starboard side to correct the list, and Lexington began recovering aircraft at 11.39. At 12.43, the ship launched five Wildcats to replace the cap and prepared to launch another nine Dauntlesses. A massive explosion at 12.47 was triggered by sparks that ignited gasoline vapors. The explosion killed 25 crewmen and knocked out the main damage control station. The damage did not interfere with flight deck operations, although the refueling system was shut down. The fueled Dauntlesses were launched, and six Wildcats that were low on fuel landed aboard. Aircraft from the morning's airstrike began landing at 1.22, and all surviving aircraft had landed by 2.14. Another explosion occurred at 2.42 that started severe fires in the hangar and blew the forward elevator 12 inches above the flight deck. Power to the forward half of the ship failed shortly afterward. Three destroyers came alongside to assist, but another major explosion at 325 knocked out water pressure in the hangar and forced the evacuation of the forward machinery spaces. The fire eventually forced the evacuation of all compartments below the waterline at 1600, and Lexington eventually drifted to a halt. Evacuation of the wounded began shortly afterward, and Captain Sherman ordered, Abandon ship, at 507. A series of large explosions began around 6 p.m. that blew the aft elevator apart and threw aircraft into the air. Sherman waited until 6.30 to ensure that all of his crewmen were off the ship before leaving himself. Some 2,770 officers and men were rescued by the task force. The destroyer Phelps was ordered to sink the ship and fired a total of five torpedoes between 7.15 and 7.52. Immediately after the last torpedo hit, Lexington finally slipped beneath the waves. In total, 216 crewmen were killed, and 2,735 were rescued. Lexington received two battle stars for her World War II service, and she was officially struck from the Naval Register on the 24th of June, 1942. Shortly after the Navy's public acknowledgement of the sinking, workers at the Four River Shipyard in Quincy, Massachusetts, where the ship had been built 21 years earlier, proposed a change in the name of one of the new Essex-class fleet carriers currently under construction in their yard. Secretary of the Navy Frank Knox agreed to the proposal, and the carrier to be named Cabot was renamed as the 5th USS Lexington on June 16, 1942. The wreck of the Lexington was located on March 4, 2018 by the research vessel Petrel during an expedition funded by philanthropist Paul Allen. A remotely operated underwater vehicle confirmed the ship's identity by the nameplate on its stern. She lies at a depth of 9,800 feet and is separated into multiple sections. 
The main section sits upright on the seabed. The bow rests flat with the stern sitting upright across from it, both approximately one nautical mile west of the main section, while the bridge rests by itself in between these sections. Seven Devastators, three Dauntlesses, and a single Wildcat were also located farther to the west, and all in a good state of preservation. Her sacrifice, and that of the men on her, kept Port Moresby in allied hands and thus kept the vital sea lanes between Australia and the United States open. Thank you for watching, and if you enjoyed this video please hit the like button, comment and subscribe so that we can bring you more insightful content just like this.